Everybody, hi. I am here once again with Derek Peter. And uh, hello, Derek. Derek, uh, are you ready to get your interview started? We got a few questions for you. Thank you for Let's do it. Thank you for staying up late in your time zone. And no uh, problem. Really, really uh, excited. Really excited about this interview. I mean, it's been great so far. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, uh, you you've, you've had some great. Uh, you've had some great facts so far. Some great. Uh, uh, teach you and uh, chat about ballads and everything, but let's get right into your interview. Like I say every week, uh, hmm. Derek, uh, if you like, uh, if you like a question, if something makes you uh, chuckle or go, that's a that's a good question. Do not thank me. Thank the I- intrepid and stunning, as always, Folkwise Interview Sleuths who helped me put together these questions. Uh, everybody, I want it. everybody in chat, thank the sleuths. If if you get one, you like too. What was that, Daisy? I was gonna say I. I feel like this will be especially fun because in our private group chats where we're coordinating all the sleuthing, everyone's been like, this is such a fun sleuth. <laughs> They've been really <laughs> excited about, about why, all the stuff that, that we found and that we get to ask you about tonight. So it's been like Great. fun. I'm like, oh, interesting. Okay, this is going to be exciting. So, Well, you ready Great. to go into it with some uh, big questions about folklore followed by some fun questions about folklore followed by a game of sorts? Yeah. All yeah, right. Let's do it. So uh, um, my interest is very peaked right now. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Glad it can help. Uh, Derek, as a, a, someone who studies ballads, when you mm. study a ballad, how are you also traveling the same path as a ballad? Mm. Um, I feel like there's like three ways I could answer this. So I might just pick one and say, oh, I say pick um, three. <laughs> well, um, sh- so, for instance, I was saying on the stream, my favorite ballad is Lampkin, and I think that's because, for whatever reason, um, within the machinations of my mind, that ballad is a really easy ballad to spatially put myself into. Mm. You have the castle, you have the lord going away, you have the villain coming to the threshold, conspiring with the nurse, coming inside, staying on the ground floor, you have the lady coming downstairs, you have the daughter up in the window. It's It's just like a very, like spatially inviting ballad um you can really put yourself like in the scene of the crime uh so a lot of times a ballad that i i choose to uh pursue studying variants of and and dive into um is spatially appealing to me Mm. um the other thing i was going to say is when i perform these ballads myself uh, some of them are quite long, and I often get comments from people of like, you don't hesitate, and how do you not mix up the verses, and how do you like remember the ballads? And it's kind of the same deal, you know, like, there's a, there's one called The House Carpenter, and it's very long, it's like eight minutes long, but I can put myself, like, at the beginning of the ballad, and then when they go on the ship, and then when, like, the first thing happens, and then when the second thing happens. So, in a way, it's kind of like reading a small book. And then reciting that book because it's it's just like station to station. You can kind of get um, like through the narrative of the ballad. And and that's really appealing to me. Um, certain ballads don't really do much for me, but certain ones obviously really do. And I think, yeah, it's, it's down to like the spatial nature of some of them and like the, the way that the story is is unfolds, not in necessarily sequential time Mm -hmm. but in space um and another thing i look for is you know as i do this work uh as i said earlier i look for people that are non-singers or source singers like people that don't necessarily perform these things on stage yeah uh, like a bobby mcmillan but who nonetheless remember these songs because their parents sang them their grandparents sang them whatever and um for me it becomes a bit almost hospice work like dealing with these longer living people you know, um, so Lena Turbofil being my favorite ballad singer, I met her daughter last year uh, for the first time, and that daughter didn't make it a year to the day that I m- met her. Like, she passed away like eight months later. Um, so dealing with these people that are on their own end-of-life journey, um, the people almost become more important than the ballads at a certain point because there's mm-hmm. some motivation for their lifestyle for them to continue to sing or remember these songs, and that to me becomes really... Um, almost more important than the, than the, the song itself. It's like the song is the hook, and then you get to know this person and their life and how they live their life, and the song becomes almost an incidental and like a like a title figurehead, a letterhead for like this person's the essay of their life. 
Um, so sometimes it's hard to do this work. Sometimes it's overwhelming at the end of the day to like reconcile all that you've kind of taken on. Um, but something that really keeps me going is that these these people are like, yeah, you know, long living informants, tradition bearers, and that, yeah, um, can kind of sometimes inform why someone would choose to remember a certain ballad and not another one. Um, but it's it's definitely kind of a a a, a double edged practice it's about the songs and then it's also about the people that sing those songs and i I wouldn't be doing my job as a folklorist if i didn't hear the word uh space and immediately ask what about place um and you're also in york right now so uh you talked about like the people in the spaces and how do the places uh that are mentioned in ballads influence how they're uh performed i guess yeah, I mean, I think that there's plenty of YouTube videos out there of, like, you know, the, the accents challenge or whatever, mm-hmm. where someone will do, like, the 50 accents of the states, and there's a girl, Amy, can't think of her last name, she's, like, a redhead, she's got a ponytail, and she does a lot of voices on oh, YouTube. Oh, yes, and, she's very good. Um, I can't think of her last name, she's great, though. I mean, if you type in, like, 50 states accent challenge, I think she'll come up, you know, but she, like... She makes the case that in New York, you kind of talk like a funnel because you need your space and you need to be heard. And, <laughs> and then like when you get to Minnesota, it's really flat because everything's really flat. So I think that the landscape like necessarily colors the way things sound. Mm-hmm. And like Gre- Gregorian mm-hmm. chants are very slow um, because the space that that music occupied was very resonant and reverberative, if there's such a word. So that music had to be very like, ooh, and slow. So it wasn't like... You know, there wasn't a bunch of like crazy like beats or whatever. And then those tiny p- punk clubs that started in the seventies that were like a shoebox. Yep. You could blast out in there because it was such a small, weird little space. So you know, there's there's like there's that angle to place of like certain things sound good in certain places. Mm-hmm. Um, but then there's also the more interesting maybe of like the history of you know like where these ballads originated from and perhaps why and um i don't feel equipped to answer the the like why um but a lot of them did come from northern england and scotland and then they made their way over to appalachia um so i'm in the motherland i'm in the origin spot um i'm in york which is northern england in yorkshire north yorkshire and next month i'm going to take a mini trip up to scotland uh, which is not that far away from here. I'm pretty close to the England Scotland border right now, sure. so I'll just take a little train up to Scotland and be there. Um, very sure. similar to Appalachia in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. So I think the argument can be made that you know, and someone pointed out on one of my Instagram comments that the Appalachian Mountains and Northumberland used to be part of the same tectonic yeah. thing, and they yes. like did that over time. So That's so hey. cool. Yeah. You are like blowing my mind right now because I spend a lot of time thinking about the influence of space and place on our development as as beings, cultural beings. And so I like that's the oh, that's my that's my whole dissertation. And so I love this idea that space has an influence on the way we speak in yeah. like a subconscious way. Like that is so cool. It's like ecology is building us as we are building with it. it oh my god, this yeah, is like hundred so percent. Cool. Yeah, you peaked like, my ecology brain now. It's like, wait, singing is ecological. Yeah, it's like a offline <laughs> process of, of ecology. Somebody call Jeff Titan. Yeah, well, get, I had like a Jeff former Tom life Tom as a. <laughs> I had a former life as like a pseudo folklorist. I was really into like Southeast Asian music and Egyptian music and like just mu- folk music, but not like American folk uh-huh. or not Anglo American folk. And uh, as I listened to a lot of like Frank Prophet dulcimer pieces Ooh. or like um roscoe holcomb or like some of the really old like folk singers a lot of that modality and sound reminds me of african and asian folk music and i think that the case can be made that when you come from a certain location of dust and coastal salt and grit and crops of a certain nature you get this kind of factor and then as, like, we've built civilization up, you know, you get the concert harps and violins and you get the, like, and it kind of flattens out that into, like, a more sculpted modernity thing. But these people that are very in touch with the land and the crops and the place and the dirt and the, like, essence of being on Earth, 
Yeah, that twang factor is still yeah. pretty strong. That twang factor. And should totally be celebrated. Yeah. I, I know my um uh, a good a good friend of mine who's an ethnomusicologist who needs to come on the show, Kurt, if you're watching. Yeah, it talks mm-hmm. a lot about uh I think you might be able to summarize his dissertation in one in one sentence uh, as uh, the twang factor of North Thailand. But oh, I need to talk to this person. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like a huge like bluegrass scene in in Northern Thailand because yeah, the twang factor is real. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Benton's dream said in the chat. Me and Derek are best friends now. I don't care. I don't care if you try to steal them. I might have to slash your tires. <laughs> slash yeah, your tires. no, I feel that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> our overlap is big, and I'm excited. Yeah, um, I got it. Yeah, gotta, there's a. I'll have you DM Kurt. You get along. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a great record label called Sublime Frequencies, and they've put out a lot of reissues of like Southeast Asian music, and a lot of Southeast Asian music has a huge preoccupation with like twangy guitar and yeah, like blues and like weird amps and like yeah, like wah pedals and stuff like that. Because I think it's very close to a lot of their indigenous music. Um. So. Derek, you talked a little bit already about uh, Lena Turbyfill, your favorite, uh, your favorite ballad singer. Yeah. And uh, and and you earlier check check the the other compilation, everyone, the other highlight reel for this video uh, to see Derek uh, uh, saying your favorite ballad, uh, Blaken, which uh, uh, she performed. But I guess what I'm curious is, can you like trace your journey of how you went from like. Uh, listening to recordings in like the Library of Congress to meeting with her uh, last surviving relative in person. Um, I have this tendency if I like something like that I've heard or experienced that I don't really leave it alone. So um, I did a I did a really <laughs> You'll like fit in small... fine around here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did a really small paperback book of poetry last year. Um, that I I'd written poems like ten years ago and didn't ever do anything with them. And I had a friend encourage me to like get the collection together and she was rebooting her press and it seemed like a good excuse to like go through all these old poems and find the nice ones and put them together and there's a little novella that i read every winter and it's called a box of matches and it's by this guy called nicholson baker who's my favorite author Mm. and i just wrote i found his email somewhere and wrote him a cold call email and i was like you wrote my favorite book i read it every single winter would you please read my poetry book and tell me what you think? And he, like, gave me a cover quote for my, like, little paperback, like, you know, not really very professional poetry book. So I, I'm setting the scene here that if I really like someone's efforts with whatever they're doing, I kind of don't just sit there and go, like, that's nice, but I'll never... I'm like, no, I get right up in that person's face, and I'm like yeah. a Taurus, and I'm like, you know, hi. Uh, <laughs> to varying degrees of success. Um yeah. Um, but uh, in the case of Lena, um, I was supposed to go to the Library of Congress and then COVID hit. Mm. And so I was kind of left at home um, doing more remote home research and wasn't able to hear these things. And so it was either through findagrave.com or just the local like white pages. But I figured yeah. out that her like last like one of her last living grandkids was still possibly reachable and so i called oh. him uh and then that led me to her daughter that i didn't i wasn't aware was still alive and got to meet her and we became really good friends um and there's just a whole bunch of people related to her in north carolina um and it's it's been so ongoing and so like you ever go somewhere and you just know that's where you're supposed to like live your life like that was my experience with western north carolina um so uh i was actually texting with one of the extended family the other day and she said i was on facebook mentioned that i was talking to a friend that was singing ballads didn't mention your name but the whole family commented that's our derek so she was like you see you belong to us now you're you're part of the family so i'm like an honorary turby phil um so it's been like when i said the last question i answered where it's like kind of overwhelming hospice work in a way and it can be really like yeah, like I, it, I can almost not take it in sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I've I've recorded many people, um, but for whatever reason, I'm on like a weird soul journey with Lena and her family. Sure. Um, and more so than any of the other informants I've ever met, uh, met, uh, she's meant like more to me. So, yeah. um, yeah. It's been it's been more than I ever ever thought. Like, cause I've like I said, I've recorded plenty of other people, and it's usually like you know 
interesting and lovely, and that's kind of where it ends. But this has been like a new, literally a new family for me. So I, I love that. That's so rewarding. Just yeah, even to hear it happen to other people. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm. It's one of the most beautiful things that's probably ever happened to me. So it's been awesome. So this next question, uh, bear bear with me a little bit. This might sound like an easy one to you. But I don't think anything like this has ever come up on our show, so I, w- I want you to put it on the record. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, this is something I hear you uh, talking about all the time in-, in interviews and such, but how is the human voice an instrument? Mm. Um, I think you can make the argument that a lot of instruments actually mimic the human voice. Mm. Like a slide guitar is kind of someone crying because their cowboy's off in the sunset, you know, like (laughs) whenever, you know, whenever SpongeBob's like floating down from the ocean, it's like a slide guitar because he's like sad. Um, yeah, the human voice is an instrument. I mean, I think that, um, I'll take a weird, I'll I'll give you a weird answer for this. There's also, there's also a practice in, in North Carolina and other parts of, the world uh specifically thinking of these north carolina tail tellers that are called jack tails mm-hmm. um yep. it's uh like jack sprat jack and the beanstalk but then like other very strange jack and the fire dragon and all sorts of strange jack tails yep uh where jack is the main character um they're they're great they're interesting, but because there's no melody to them, I'm less engaged. I think that when the human voice starts linking melody in a consistent way, um, there's a magic there. And uh, I would arguably call that an instrumental force. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've often treated the human voice in strange ways, like chopped it up on the computer, collaged it together. Um, so I see, it, I see it as like something you can just sample like uh, any other instrument. Yeah. Definitely. No, that's a good answer. Uh, the first thing I think of when you say instruments mock the, the human voice, I believe it's an interview with uh, uh, Ramin Jawadi, who did the uh, the music for Game of Thrones, where he said, like, uh, Lady Stark's cello theme is supposed to be a mother crying. Mm. Yeah. Like, he's the, like, uh, the, if, if it, an instrument, a cat, whatever, something that's supposed to make you, like, perk you up and make you emotional is, are always imitating human uh, voices. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, definitely. Yeah. Like flutes are like. Flutes really, are happy. <laughs> yeah. Re- yeah. Like related to sunlight and breath and oxygen and clouds, you know? Yeah. yeah. Breathy. Yeah. I yeah. really thought about calling something breathy. <laughs> yeah. um, Derek, the work you do in uh, folkloristics, do you see yourself more in the tradition of like an Alan Lomax or more in the tradition of like a Joan Baez? <laughs> well, I, I I think sometimes I'll look at a picture of like Almeida Riddle in front of Alan Lomax, mm-hmm. and I'm constantly wanting to be both Alan and Almeida. <laughs> like I want to both be the person documenting and the performer. Um, so both both the yeah. Um, I I think my role at this point is more of a documenter than a performer although i really love performing these songs i've seemed to have fallen into um well i used to love like well i still do but like when i was younger you know maxi singles would come out some of you might be too young to be like what's this single you know like a maxi single it was like a cd that had like a bunch of remixes on it so people like bjork or madonna would put these out you know oh yeah oh yeah seven or eight remixes on it um, and I and I kind of became like a a librarian of these remixes. I'd get really completist, and I'd want like every remix up, available of a song. Um, so in a way, I've been training to like compile versions of a song my whole life, and now it just happens to be ballads. Huh. Um, but I yeah, I'd say I'm pretty geared towards being like a librarian at this point. Interesting. Okay, yeah. I like that answer. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I was about to move into like the the fun questions. Um. And Daisy, I think there might be questions from chat too. I think after your last answer, Derek, I gotta ask you this next uh, question I have, which is: it. What are the methodological similarities between being a DJ and being a song catcher? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I just started to answer that a little bit. You started but, you know, answering a little bit. You were getting there, yeah. so I had to. I had to spring on it. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, it's it's about editing and it's about um. Yeah, compiling like um 
DJing, I mean, I love to DJ. You know, I love mm-hmm. to play like a weird, noisy DJ set. Um, but I, yeah, hmm. Yeah, I think it's a lot about preparation of of how you're going to present something, right? Like you're going to, if you're going to have a DJ set, you have to read the room mm-hmm. and you have to have a certain mood in mind and a certain curve, like of, of how the night's going to kind of go. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't make sense to put like Bangladeshi recordings together with like Kentucky dulcimer pieces. You know, you have to have, you have to like have a scope of like, you know, if you're going to release a compilation or a collection, you know, it's like kind of the same as a DJ set. You need to have some kind of coherence. Um, but yeah, I think it also just goes back to that kind of scavenging attitude, scavenging mm-hmm. attitude of like finding all the versions of something or like really sussing out like the origins or the the availability of like the different, not even the origin, but just how the how it's slime molded out into various weird shapes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm picturing uh you answering that question with like the predator handshake meme, of like. Oh no! What I meant to say is when I DJed, my decks just have petri dishes on them. Oh oh oh! Okay okay great awesome, thanks for sharing. <laughs> Daisy, should I keep going with more uh, more fun questions like this, or should I, uh, or you got some questions from chat? Um, I have a few questions from chat, but they are also fun questions. Um, so let, hit, hit Derek with some of those uh, fun questions right now. Okay. And and by the way, um, everyone who's watching this, if you're in chat, post a question. If it's like a long one, you can send it to uh, folkwise13 at gmail.com. But yeah, the, now is the time. If you've got questions, Derek will answer. Yes. Um. Uh, dang, most people are just like really, really hype about this chat. But one, a, an example of this is uh, Benton's Dream just said, Jack Tales are Tolkien. And I'm going to turn that into a question and say, do you agree or disagree with this hot take? Jack Tales oh, are 100%. Tolkien. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, full of like amazing symbolism and mysticism, but also just full of like the hero's journey, Jack kind of being like the hero. Yeah. Tom and Will kind of being the like the slain or like the failed or like the bad example. Um, you know. So yeah, I think the short answer is yes, definitely. Yeah. I'd like to see I'd like to see um just a bunch of uh, Jack Tales rewritten to be uh Tom Bombadil. That's <laughs> that's my hot take. Uh Daisy, the cube another. Um, another one we got was, what is your favorite film and is it Songcatcher? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I did just make my partner watch Songcatcher and I was a bit like, this is what's wrong with that. This is what's wrong with that. But it is a beautiful film. I do love that film. Um, I think my favorite movie is either Running With Scissors or, that's a good. That's a good movie. I don't know or the one. Darje or the Darjeeling Limited. Mm. Oh my God! Wait, wait, wait! We have to talk about Darjeeling Limited because for a really long time that was also my favorite movie. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I, have, Dom like, has, Dom, twelve go, things close, in common with everyone. <laughs> oh my God, Dom! Close your ears. We're gonna have like a cinema talk right now. Okay, so Darjeeling Limited is really good. I like the feather situation that they get put in um, yes. on the mountain. That's yes. a very memorable part. And have you seen the short film that goes with it? Yes, I have. That's that song that's in it. Um, who is it by? It's going. Uh, it's where do you go to, my lovely? And it's. It's not Serge Gains- Gainsbourg. No, no, it's, it's um, not. I'm gonna. I'll post it in the chat. I forget who it's yeah. by, but that is like an amazing song, and I sing it all the time. And wow, I'm so glad that you also know that movie. What's running with <laughs> yeah? It's based uh, on a memoir, right? Yeah. Um. Never read the book. Love the movie. Okay. Love me some Annette Benning. Annette Benning, okay. Um, just watched um American Beauty the other day. Annette Benning and Alice and Janie are both in that movie, and I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I want Alice and Janie to do a cameo on my next album. Do you think you can make it happen? Really hard. I'm gonna work really hard to make that happen. Cool, you know? cool, cool. Uh might be more of a marathon than a sprint, but I'm going like, to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, next album doesn't mean uh, the very next. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, it could just be the general next. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh... um, I mean, I don't know if this is if this is a shit post or if this is a real question, trip, Triptalon, um, but what's your favorite Daft Punk song? <laughs> mm. No, I bet, I bet you've got... I bet, uh, I bet you've got a good, uh, a good opinion. <laughs> Um, I can't think of the name of it because I don't 
my um I'm bad with names sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um no, it's not that one. Well, okay, I'm gonna just I'll just um Around the World is great, but I can't think of the one that I really like. I'll say Around the World though. Okay. Yeah. Uh Daisy, what's yours? Mine, I don't I don't know. Okay. Um Around the world is a good one. I, I have Harder, a better, that one. That one I feel great. like has lasting power because it's like a song that you could play in the back of pretty much any bar and have it just be kind of chill. Mm-hmm. Okay. And like, the- not it's not off putting. Well, my favorite Daft Punk song is the song. Uh, is the exact opposite. It is the least chill <laughs> Daft Punk song. No, I love uh, Giorgio by Marauder. Oh my god. That that starts with four minutes of them uh interviewing Giorgio Moroder about his life story before like the actual dance music comes in. Oh my god. <laughs> the most off they would in the Daft Punk catalog. Yes. They yes. would. Uh I got I got some more questions. Can I ask uh can I ask a couple more, Daisy? Yeah. Uh Derek. Who is oh. Appalachian Loki? Oh man. Wow. Um well, sense. I envisioned for my last record this sort of. So I guess some background on Loki is that they are non-gendered mm-hmm. uh, historically mm-hmm. and mischievous and a bit like, yeah, the kind of trickster archetype, um, a bit like the fool tarot card, which is my favorite tarot card. Um, and so when I wrote my last record, I felt like I wasn't really doing, so (laughs) I started that album thinking I was going to make a bright eyes record full of vibraphone and brush drums. And I also thought it was going to be a doo-wop record because I was listening to a lot of Lambert, Hendrix and Ross. (laughs) And it ended up being like, (laughs) yeah, and it ended up being neither of those. It ended up being like a, an, an Appalachian cowboy fever dream. Oh, wow. But I felt like I hadn't really done it properly. So instead of putting myself in like a black t-shirt and Levi's on the cover, mm-hmm. I decided to not do that and kind of be like, yeah, admit that it was kind of like a a distortion of Appalachian music. So that's kind of where the trickster element came oh, in. But Appalachian Loki, gotcha. Appalachian Loki just kind of pops in and out. He's sort of my like superhero cape. And then I like fall off the side of the building into the garbage cans. <laughs> Um, I bring that up That's only. A, I bring that up only to ask. Image. It really <laughs> is. <laughs> Derek, I bring that up only to ask the question I really want to ask, which is: Pitch me an episode of season two of Marvel's Loki where Tom Hiddleston's Loki and Appalachian Loki have an adventure together. Um, having having zero Marvel context or background because I don't pay attention to Marvel, Fair. I'm gonna say that they just have a, they have a they have a platonic gay picnic and feed some wild animals. <laughs> Yeah, yes, that, that yes. would work. That would be consistent yes. with what they laid out in season one somehow. <laughs> Great, because that's all I would want to see if I tune into that. <laughs> <laughs> there is there is an extensive uh, sequence in an episode of Marvel's Loki where he, uh, uh, Tom Hiddleston Loki gets a room full of people drunk singing folk songs to create a diversion. So, oh, great. yeah, it would work. <laughs> great. I'm um, here for that. And uh I th- you 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 kind of you kind of got to this next question in uh earlier but not in like this like kind of specific terms. Why is Elk Park, North Carolina your favorite place in Appalachia? Boy, these sleuths really dove. Great. <laughs> um I live in yeah. fear of what they can find out about me. <laughs> No, that's great. Bring it on. Um, <laughs> well, that's that's where Lena is from. And then when I went to go meet her daughter, um, Nikki, Nikki lives not 500 feet away from where Lena's house once stood. It's kind of fallen into like ruin. Huh. It was like a tin roof house. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, you know, you ever go somewhere and you just feel like you're just you just shouldn't leave. That's Elk Park for me. It's it's a population 500 town on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee, and it is just the most beautiful place I've ever been to. Um, Have been many places recording many people, and again, that was the one that really, like, shot an arrow through my heart of, like, you just are full of love for this place and belong here. Yeah. Oh, Ben's dream spent her entire last summer in Elk Park. 
Oh my god, we need to we need to go exploring. <laughs> what yeah. is yeah, what is this beautiful blossoming friendship? Hang the, the out two, already. It's the so two, good. the yeah. guest last week and the guest this week have apparently done all the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, I need you two to crazy. I need you two to hang out and then simultaneously Snapchat me your adventure <laughs> from yes. afar. I wanna be I wanna be there in spirit. <laughs> yeah. Um my my action plan right now just to to be official is I come home from the UK in November gonna spend my triple whammy holiday with my family obviously up in connecticut and mm-hmm. then i'm gonna go to my new family in the spring when it's not so scary to drive so like march or april benton stream i will come find you in my um what my friend has affectionately said is a fuck boy subaru from <laughs> uh yeah well uh how old is it now what is it like an sti 90, uh no it's a four it's a red forester it's from 98 oh, so in a couple years it gets okay. to uh, get to put vintage plates on. <laughs> let's go <laughs> yeah. Sorry to anyone with an STI where when I immediately vocalized that uh association. <laughs> um Yeah, historic plates. And uh I know uh, Daisy already said it in uh in chat, but thank you T Papas for the gift sub. Um that was apparently a reward for the sleuths for the uh reaction you just gave to that question, Derek. Great. <laughs> um It's all coming together. Got any uh uh, Daisy, you got any more questions? Uh, or, uh, or is it time to move um, into... The only, the only other question that I kind of have, which I think is an offhanded question that Joel Chappening posted, but we can, we can dig into it, is Daft Punk folklore? Is that folk music? I, hmm. Wouldn't know it as such. I, um, they broke. They broke up. So it's 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 a gray area, isn't it? Because you, I guess you could. Well, I don't know. It's a gray area. I would say French House has some interesting sort of. Uh, there, there's interesting like community roots to what like the French latched on to their house music scene. You know, as far as like, uh, there was kind of like a. Uh, sort of like backlash to to disco in America in like the early '80s, and then the the French took all the kind of things that like normative America hated about disco, like the sort of like uh, queer inner city culture, uh, and they just went like, oh yeah, actually we love these are the best parts about America. Um, and I'd say like that that maybe if, if you're saying like is is Daft Punk part of like a like 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 a like a sort of folk group tradition that that is how i would spin that question to be yes other than that ooh, i don't know <laughs> yeah my knee my knee my knee jerk reaction is to be like no not really yeah yeah well i uh i'll uh i'll, I'll try to i'll try to argue most things i like have at least some sort of like folklore influence to them but i mean no they got paid they got paid millions of dollars to do giant shows <laughs> Yeah. There, there was like the, the 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 commercial drive underpinning them, not like just sharing music in a group. So in that in that way, I'm with Derek on that. Clearly not. <laughs> um, I think though it might be time to talk a little bit about uh talk a little more about about music. Um, for this last question I have for you, Derek, that's going to lead into our uh like activity for the tail end of your interview um i i can't help but notice i can't help but notice in your uh your your career has spanned so many different like genres of music you were talking about djing earlier you're talking about like your current work uh as like a like a song a song catcher ballad scholar um can you kind of trace your career's evolution across musical genres Mm. yeah i'll do the speed dating version um i was in choir when i was really young and would also sing along to like disney films Mm -hmm. and you know so when i came out my parents were like duh Um, you know, it was always singing pretty, when I was a kid. That's a pretty good reaction. Yeah, I, yeah. That's, 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 good, like, that's a good that's one. Very relatable. That's a good, yes. Did not look up from their Newsweek. They were like, we know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was always singing as a kid. So always had like a strong participation in choir. Was always just purely singing. And then, yeah, like the pop thing happened to me in like 
2003, 4, 5, 6. So, like, American Life by Madonna, Medulla by Bjork, Kala by M.I.A., all these kind of glitchy, weird, insane pop albums. And so when I started making music, I was like, I can do that. That sounds fairly easy. You just loop a bunch of crazy shit. Did that for a long time. Kind of um, made, um, like, on the more minimal, serious side of electronic music for a long time. Um, but always had some element of like the acoustic or the folk or the ethno music in mm-hmm. my work. Uh, and have always loved singers. Uh, and so when I started getting into the Appalachian thing, it wasn't such a huge seismic shift for me. It just kind of made sense. There's the token video conference cat. I'm so glad to see it great yes my sweet baby cat hopped into my screen i'm sorry baby that the cat. public can't the public no, can't great. see baby cat but she can be here with me she likes to be on camera i can hear the purrs baby Aww. cat you came into our lives she has a little theme song mm-hmm. she has a she has a theme song she Aww. came into she came into our lives just baby uh, <laughs> she's like what are you doing should i put baby on should i put baby on stream real quick if you want is she still there we're vibing yeah. i'm holding her oh Aww. baby hi baby <laughs> Hmm. Oh, hello, baby it's cat. It's a baby. What? That's a fun diversion. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, back with yeah. Derek. Yeah. Hello, um, baby here. <laughs> but but yeah, I've done like done a little bit of everything. You know, I've done some DJing. I've done some lecturing. I've done yeah, some folk collecting. Mm-hmm. Um, just love. I just love music. You know, love classical music. Love you know noise music. Love traditional music. It's it's all all paths lead to the greater good. People may or may not know that uh, Folkwise has a Spotify account where we make playlists. Uh, we've got Daisy. Can you talk about uh, the Folkwise Spotify a little bit? Because I know you're oh uh, heavily involved in that. Yeah, hell yeah, I can. Um, we we make some playlists. Um, it's a new thing we're trying out. Uh, it's a it's a Spotify account for Folkwise, and we do a couple different things. Um, one of them being we try to follow and listen to, yeah, me, make playlists that exist that are about folklore. So there are lots of people who are already curating folk music related playlists. There are also a couple of playlists that uh, one of our Folkwise team members, Anna, has curated like a material culture playlist, which it's is a really textiles. Int- yeah, it's called textiles, and it's a very it's very interesting because you don't usually think of like material culture when you think of music, unless you start thinking instruments, but that's not what this is. This is yeah. called textiles and it's different. Um, there's also a food waste playlist. That's just a bunch of like food emotes or emojis. Uh, and it's really cool. And uh, we made a playlist of all of Dom's pre stream hype music. So uh, yep. as we, Oh, and we have a, I think we also have a playlist of just our general, um music we play on the show every single week and as partner who who makes music yep. um so we've got all kinds of stuff related to our show on there and we hope to release more and more so Great. please follow we- us on on spotify and because i think uh with that in mind um we're gonna try something we haven't done as a guest activity yet derek we made a playlist uh like a guest playlist for you yeah, uh, that we called Derek Peters' auto ethnographic song catcher journey. Um, I love and this that is, title. This is going to be live. This is like live on our Spotify as you give me uh, as you give me ideas for it. But can you pick uh, some of uh, some of the songs that sort of represent your like uh, career or interest in folklore or interest in music in general? for us to put in this uh this uh playlist on our spotify yeah um i already have one in mind go for it uh it's it's one of my own and if that sounds really self-aggrandizing it's not because it's actually just a recording of my grandmother and i talking <gasps> oh and what's that called um oh, it's called such folklore <laughs> yeah it's called road work um so uh one word oh um and so Something I haven't talked about yet, and when I talk about hospice journey with um, either of those, should be fine. The yep. deluxe or the re- is fine. Oh, oh um, we go deluxe about... on the stream when the guest is Great. here. <laughs> um, my grandma was my favorite person in my life, and she lived to be ninety nine. 
So when she was about 90, I started to realize that I wanted to hold on to her somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, So for like 10 years, I recorded her clandestinely. And so this was kind of my proto field recording. Sure. Um, I wonder if we, it's a short little piece. I wonder if we couldn't all listen to it because it's one of my favorite things and I haven't heard it. it. Yeah, we got time. Let's listen to it. Yeah, I thought it was way up, but it's right here, right? It's quite, seems funny not to have traffic. to it. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh-huh. I guess they're all going up Sealy. Yeah, they are. They said they were. Yeah, so um, when she passed away, I tried to make sense of some of these recordings and put them to minimal music uh, as like an elegy. So that was two years ago. Uh, So that was kind of the first time I was like, hmm, I've been documenting people's lives. That's, it was, it was a great. That's so cool. It was a great piece. I I loved it. And what it, yeah, I. Not not like there was a rule that you couldn't put your own song on there, but that definitely needs to to go first and foremost. I agree. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of not quite mine because it's really about her yeah, in a really, way. So it feels she's a bit the featured yeah. artist. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like you were saying, mm. uh, like you were saying earlier, that was like her her voice, not even singing, but just her voice and like the yeah. melodic qualities of listening to to your grandma speak. Yeah, and so when I went through, I have, like, over an hour of her speaking that I just, little snips and bits on my yeah. iPhone or whatever, you know. And so, yeah, I was like, okay, all right, all right, I've been doing this for a while then. So cool. Um, hmm, what else can I put on here? So an early folk, like, influence of mine that um, is really important to me is Shirley Collins. Uh, might want to do um, Plains of Waterloo is a really good one. Plains of Waterloo. Got it. Yeah. Um, so that was that was a song that meant a lot to me. Um, like when I was 16, 17, 18, she she uh yeah, that was so she's she's from Sussex, she's from England. She's mm-hmm. a um actually just put an EP out. Um she's eighty six, so she was a big Brit folk act in the seventies. And she has like a weird second life to her career right now. So yeah, definitely, definitely uh, Shirley Collins. Um, I'm trying to think of something from, uh, let's take a peek on my own iTunes sure. and see speaking to me. Um, there's a great song that I might throw in chat from uh, Dust to Digital compilation. Uh, I love Dust to Digital. We yeah, share their La- stuff on our Instagram all the time mm-hmm. because Lance it's just and- so, so cool. Um, so that's a re- probably going to be really hard to find, but it's all from this uh, um, compilation. I don't know if that was helpful. Uh, if not, I can pick another Dust to Digital. Um, but um, yeah. Um, What's a good Dust to Digital? Dust to di- oh, Dust. Is it's uh, triple double hyphenated like that? Oh well, um, I put it in the stream mods chat. Oh Daisy, no. Oh, that's like the one thing Dom can't access. Yeah. Right? Nope. Sorry, I got too many things. <laughs> yeah, <open. laughs> I can I can copy and paste it into the folk wise chat. Would that help you? Search it on Spotify. 
No. Yeah, it's oh, hard. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. If you put it in, if you dropped it in chat, yeah. I'd rather I'd Ooh. rather copy really paste it than butcher it. Yes. Yeah. Did I find it? Hey, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Tell, tell us about this song. Oh, nice. All right. Um. Well, uh, that's uh, that's a Vietnamese opera piece. Ooh. Uh, but I, I, again, I have a, a a big love of Southeast Asian music, and so that's one of my favorites. Uh, of like the time I've spent listening to music like that, sure. which is which kind of was like an earlier experience for me. Um, and then moved into um. Yeah, like the Appalachian stuff slightly more recently. Um, but another bridge into uh, this stuff, curiously, is more English folk music. So I wonder Hit if me. you just punch in all jolly fo fellows that follow the plow, there's going to be like a, a bunch of versions that sure. come up. Um, and then we'll try and find a nice one. All right, we've got, uh, we got Bob Mills. Yeah, that'd be the one. Oh, Bob Perfect. Mills? Hit me. Yeah, that's the one. Cool. Great. Um, love that version of that. It's a really common Shropshire for farm song. A lot of people knew that song about 100 years ago. Uh, I, I was able to record it on a farm a few weeks ago. Oh, cool. It's hard to find now. It's like people don't really sing it, but um, it's it's a good one. Um, another singer I really liked when I was getting into folk music was Anne Briggs. Um... I think it's double GS, yeah. What and she I... did a nice song called The Cuckoo. Uh, might be C U C K. C U? Yeah, C K O O. Great. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about um, Ann Briggs. Um, hmm. Uh, kind of. There's there were three ladies and I'm gonna to get to the third who's June Tabor but there there were like these three, uh yeah British folk singers that I like found fairly early on when I was still in high school who um I think Last FM recommended them all to me because I was listening to, to like Joni Mitchell or something that wasn't quite authentic folk music or wasn't like traditional folk music I guess yeah 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 that was like a uh, folk folk rock folk <laughs> pop. Yeah, I mean, I love Joni Mitchell to pieces, don't get me wrong, but it was these three ladies, like I say, that were kind of adjacent um, to Joni. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so let's go for uh, some June Tabor. And how do you spell her last name? T-A-B-T-A-B-O-R. Oh, got it. Uh, what song? Yeah. Um, Rain or Dine, maybe? Which would be R E Y N A R uh Ray R E Y N A Yeah, Ray Rainer Oh it's it's R E Y. It's R what? E Y. R E Y there yeah. we go. There it is. Yeah, great. Rainer Dime by by June Tabor. Yeah. Oh cool. I almost feel like we should try and listen to some of these when I'm done with this to how, how uh, you know, uh, we, we, I think, I think, uh, nine's kind of our lucky number on, on folk wise. So do you have three more? Yeah, I can do three more. Let's do it. Definitely. Um, Gene Ritchie. Let's, let's do Gene Ritchie. And that uh, is... if you can J J E A N. J E A N. Yeah. And then R Ritchie. Yeah. Okay. And let's do, um, uh, let's go for hangman. Yeah. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh two more, let's think. Um, so then let's do Almeda Riddle. Yeah, okay. How do you, how do you spell her first name? A L M E D A. Uh which one what song do you want? Oh uh what do we got? Yeah, um Frog One According is great. Oh perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great song. Um, one more, one, one more. Bring us home, more. Dad. Yeah, let's see. I'm oh, gonna, thank um, you for the gift sub, Benton's, uh, Benton's stream. Uh, let's go for, um, just like looking at what I've recently added. So we have like the last one is maybe the, the one of the f more fresh, you know. Mm -hmm. Let's do John Hartford with the Morning Bugle. Is that Hartford? I found that a, uh, Hartford with an A R T. Yeah, Hartford, and then Morning Bugle. 
Morning Bugle. Yeah. Um, I was actually just on a program for Boone Area Community Radio called Ooh. The Morning Bugle, and this is their theme song. And nice. I was like, it's actually a really, really nice, really nice song. So awesome. Yeah. Um, Here's which, my nine. Which one of these? Uh, which one of these you want to play? Hmm. Shoot, let's play Hangman by Gene Ritchie because that's it. short and, and sweet. Yeah, short and yeah. sweet's the second shortest one next to next to yours. Let's yeah. do it. All right. Gene Great. Ritchie, Hangman. Yes, love. Yes, love. I bring you some gold, some gold for to pay your fee. And I just come for to take you home so we can marry be. That was great. Yeah, she's awesome. What what instrument is that? Is that a mandolin or what? No, it's a lap dulcimer. So oh, for those of you that cool. don't know, it looks like it's like yay big and it sits in your, your lap. And she is the one responsible for Joni Mitchell playing that instrument. Oh, uh, no, no way, no way, no way. Okay. Yeah, if it weren't for Gene Ritchie bringing that instrument out of Appalachia, J- Joni Mitchell would never have known about it or performed California or Case of You on it. Oh, Case of You. Okay, I can hear it now. Or is it all I want? I think it's all over blue, actually. I think it's sure. all over that album. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Derek, do you have a? Oh, normally I wrap this up with something. Yo, you know what? You know what I can say? You know what I can say? Everyone that is live now, that is the Derek Peter Auto Ethnographic Songcatcher Journey playlist. It's live on Folkwise's Spotify, and uh, it is it is there for all of your. Uh, your folk music adventures uh, in your listening future. Uh, but it is getting late on Derek's end. Derek, I, I uh, want to, yeah, well, I want to ask if you've got anything you want to plug right now while you've got the the, the digital podium. Yes, I also want to say I have I have many a link ready, and Benton's Dream has been posting lots of links to other <laughs> related music in the chat. Yeah, and Wait. wow, that um, was really cool. Yes, tell us what to plug. I have a list of things that that you could suggest for us to plug. Well, um, probably the biggest thing for me is um, I just did a book on Lampkin and put Woo. it on my Bandcamp, and it's called The Lampkin Reader, uh, and basically. Um, I guess the honest answer is that when I make this as an audio compilation and put it on CD, I will probably have more of an academic and sterile essay to go along with the, like, liner notes, and it's going to be a little more like, and so I wanted to take the texts of the songs and sort of represent them visually, uh, and have a little more fun with uh, these versions that I've been collecting that no one has really heard. Um, cause I like really deep dove into these repositories to get these versions that no one has ever heard of. Um, cause I sh- sure can't find them on the web, um, which has been great fun and I'm excited to share them, but I wanted to share them in a more like creative visual collage ish gummo ish way. Mm-hmm. So the book's like slightly dark and fucked up and artsy. Um, and then the, the CD it's not going to be joyless, but it's going to be a little bit more like cohesive or whatever. So I just had a lot of fun with uh, the Lampkin Reader, and you can get that on my Bandcamp. Nice. Um, so that's the thing I'm most excited about right now. What what we... is the what's the opposite of sterile? Contagious. Folkwise is academic and contagious. <laughs> We're trying to be. <laughs> We're trying. Opposite of sterile. Yeah, like yeah, like yeah. viral. Viral. Oh yeah, well. Sure. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah. We, I also just posted a number of links to your various artist social media pages. Uh, so everybody follow those if you get a chance. You can keep up with Derek on all kinds of platforms. Um, and Benton's Dream posted a link specifically to your uh, Lampkin Reader on Bandcamp. And then I posted a link to your Bandcamp album that's available, making and then unmaking. Um, so folks, check it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just did a record and put it out in May, and I had a whole bunch of like "fuck you" money from COVID because that's what America yeah. did, right? They yep. gave us yeah. some "fuck you" money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I was able to work really closely with a friend I've had for a long time called Scott Salter, um, who is uh, basically the, the engineer and mix engineer of like the Mountain Goats. Yeah. Uh, also got to work with Nick Vernez, who was like animal collective he did some stuff for meriwether mm-hmm. how is uh, this cool 
<laughs> well, oh I, I, you know Wait. what it was? It was it was more like I was never the rich kid with the dream, but then I had like the rich kid's dream, so I was able to like spend money on these. Well, Scott and I have known I've known Scott for a for a while, but it was never I don't know. It's that was a bit like the Nick Vernes thing was a little more like that was a that was a Richie Rich for Christmas kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, so we I don't actually think we ever addressed this while we were alive, but as the sleuths, as I alluded to earlier, were so excited when, when they were searching uh, info on you um, because you have a Wikipedia page and it apparently has a, a silly story in the creation of said Wikipedia page. Well, I didn't have a hand in creating it, but I was at a bar a few years ago and uh, this guy from the New York Times was in town and because I live near New York City. Oh, yeah. Um, and he was just like having a few drinks and my friend from NYU was with me, my friend that teaches at NYU. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like, oh, I could do a story on both you guys, you know, like you teach at NYU and you're a musician. And he was like obviously drunk and didn't mean it, but, you know, I humored him. And so he was talking to my friend from NYU and they were telling him about like their academic whatever background. And um, then he like Googled me and he was like, oh, nice Wikipedia page. And I was like, yeah, pull the other one. And he was like, no, dude. And I was like, oh, I didn't know I had a Wikipedia page. Okay. <laughs> But the funny, the funny thing is, um, I my assistant uh, that works for me like remotely because I don't go on Facebook and there's certain things that like don't do. So I have a friend in Miami that does things for me mm -hmm. on the internet. That's cool. He went into the guts of said Wikipedia page and he found out that whoever created it, the only other things they deal with on Wikipedia are articles related to Ayn Rand or Ayn Rand. Oh wow! You say okay. That. And I just so could obscure. not stop. I could not what stop laughing. Heck? Wow. Yeah, I I, it was really I, you know, I've known you for two hours. That doesn't seem like your vibe at all. That's why yeah. I like couldn't stop laughing. That was like the yeah, I thought that was That's kind of amazing. That's hysterical. What the heck? Yeah. That's so funny. Wow. So yeah, me and Ayn Rand, baby. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? <laughs> Weird. Well, well, hey. Everybody, everybody, I had a lot of fun uh talking to Derek. I hope you did too. Uh Give give Derek a, a hearty GGs in chat. I already see people who know the drill who are posting ladders for you. Everything is ladders, people. It's a Zelda night, so uh, you know, give uh, give Derek a hearty a hearty GG. And uh, I know it is uh, it is it is uh, late over in the UK right now, um, so I won't keep it you is. up any longer. Um, with that, I think it's also about time. Uh, Daisy and I are going to go on break for a little bit. And, I think we're uh, going to have maybe maybe a 10-ish minute break, and we are going to check back in and get ready. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, and then we are going to check back in and finally return to our cliffhanger of a scene with Calamity Ganon. Yeah. And then uh, a bunch of different guests from our past Zelda streams are going to pop in and out periodically and say, hey, what's up? Oh, you're defeating the boss now. Cool. And then maybe we'll play Gardic Phone. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever the vibe is. Who knows? Is. Thanks for the follow, <laughs> Triptalon. Um, all right. Thank you, Triptalon. Derek, say goodnight, and uh, we'll be on break. See you. Uh, see everyone. Thank you in, so uh, much 15. for this. This was so much fun. Thanks for coming on. I had a lot of fun, too. Yeah. This is great. Sick. All right. right. Well, um, one of you message me tomorrow and let me know how it goes beating the boss. Oh, please. sure. Will do. Oh, immediately. Not... Immediately. Yes. I'm on pins and needles, or one, sh one could say needles and pins. Hey. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.